Welcome to Move Your Mind. My name is Nick Brax, and this is a podcast where we have real conversations with real people and give real advice. Curiosity is such an important trait, and it leads to some of the best things in life. My next guest is one of the most curious people you'll ever meet, and it's led to a lifetime of self-improvement and a career in helping people all over the world. Danielle Poser is a cancer survivor who is deeply passionate about the subject of well-being, what it means to live a full and meaningful life, and she believes well-being should be central to all decision-making at the individual, organisational and societal level. Her work is dedicated to making that a reality. As a workplace well-being advisor, she works with organisations to help them develop comprehensive long-term well-being strategies. She's also vice chair of the Global Wellness Institute's Workplace Wellbeing Initiative. In addition, Danielle's website, The Wellbeing Hacker, offers research-based online courses and coaching programs for individuals. Thank you so much for supporting this podcast. If you'd like to learn more, you can go to nickbrax.com. And if you'd like to purchase the Move Your Mind book, you can go to nickbrax.com slash book. Danielle, great to see you. And so I said this so many times, but last time we were chatting, it was almost like we should have just recorded that as a podcast because you, <laughs> you know, you, you have a bit of a talk and get to know each other and discuss ideas and it turns into this, you know, going on all these tangents and really interesting subjects come up. So anyway, I'm glad to glad that we can make the time to have another conversation now. Yeah, me too. I'm sure we, there won't be a shortage of tangents. I, I can assure you of that. <laughs> No, I'm sure. I'm sure there won't be. No, you've got so many interesting things that you've you done in your life and that you are doing, and not enough time. There, there's never with people like yourself. There's never enough time in, you know, one episode to cover everything. So oh, we'll thanks. have to do a follow up if it goes well. If you're happy enough okay. to come back, yeah. On. Um, yes. <laughs> anyway, but before before we get into it, um, I always ask the guests just for our listeners to get to know you a little bit more and learn about you. Can you just give a, a brief overview on? Um, your background and how you came to be doing what you're doing today. Yeah, sure. So, um, so my kind of, you know, day job and business is, um, workplace wellbeing advisor. So, um, uh, you know, or really a wellbeing advisor because I work with individuals and, and companies on improving wellbeing. I'm a, I'm a, uh, wellbeing junkie basically, and, and constantly studying the, the, uh, the subject, but I work with organizations on their culture strategy to Im- improve well-being. Um, and I also do some, some individual coaching, but, um, yeah, I guess in terms of just more of the background on it, I've always, I've always had this, uh, interest, not just in like, when I say well-being, I more so mean life. I've always been, uh, somebody who is intrigued by the bigger questions. I've always loved philosophy. Um, and uh have been a bit of a self-help kind of junkie always reading all those kinds of books and doing those courses um and i also had cancer as a kid so so i think kind of at an early age i was i was asking you know i was wondering like why why i had something like that had such a an intense experience as a kid and and as a result like what's the purpose of my life you know so um so a lot of that is, you know, where, where my work now, you know, kind of stems from. Um, but then more on the professional side, I've, I've had my own business for about 10 years before that I worked for Gallup, um, and Gallup, you know, was, and still is, you know, one of the, the major, um, thought leading organizations on human behavior and human psychology. Um, and that gave me a really great foundation for, for the, the work that I, that I do now. And then, um, I guess the only thing, you know, the other piece that I would add, um, that I just think is maybe relevant for this whole conversation is I've also done a lot of work with Deepak Chopra. He's been a bit of a personal mentor for me and we've worked together on, um, um, several different, different, um, uh, endeavors. And he's, he's played a big role in my life in terms of, expanding my expertise on the subject of, of well-being and deepening my kind of spirituality and, um, sense of, of, of purpose in life. So that's, that's it in a nutshell, I guess. (laughs) Well, lots of things to touch on here. And, uh, um, yeah, I guess going through that experience at such a young age with, with cancer, 
like you're saying, it must have made you look at the world in a different way, think more deeply, have a just a different mindset from a from an age when people when kids normally aren't thinking like that. Was that do you think that was something that was um natural to you as well or was it mainly a product of dealing with such a serious thing at a young age or or a bit of both yeah i mean you know i i was i was five when i was diagnosed you know so it's not like when like i do remember you know i do remember a good amount of the the whole the whole experience i think that you know when when you after you finish going through the whole thing, you know, when you're like, I was like basically seven at the time, it's not like I was having any deep thoughts as, as the, as the seven year old, or may, maybe I was, I don't know. But, but, um, but I think it was like more so when I, when I was a teenager and I started to, you know, notice my interest in, um, you know, more of the philosophical, you know, you know, books or, or, you know, once I started to kind of understand more of what my interests were, I, uh, that was when I really started to reflect on, on what had happened to me and ask more questions about it. I was actually asked to, um, to give a keynote when I was 15 for the children's cancer research, um, foundation. So they wanted me to kind of share my story as a survivor to help inspire families. And I remember when I was, um, preparing that speech when I was 15, that I, um, I started to really like think about what happened, what like happened, you know, I had, so I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It was stage, it was stage three. Um, and, uh, and, and there was, you know, there were some like complications and different things that happened that made it, made it scary, you know, at times. Um, but what it did really, you know, force me to think about is like, you know, I believe that things happen to us for a reason. And, and I, and I believe that whatever happens to us, the meaning that we create from those experiences is the most important part, what we choose to make them mean, right? Like, and I, and I really felt like it was a way for me to remember that my life is fragile and that I, that I went through that experience to increase my awareness for other people who have gone through or are dealing with those types of things and to come out of it and, and say, okay, well, you know, life, like these things can happen in life. And, and I do think that I'm here for a reason. And if I'm here for a reason, like, what is that, you know, what is that, that purpose and reason? And it also, the other, the other thing that, the other way that I think it really impacted me is that I believe so strongly in the power of the human spirit. I really do. And I think that, you know, there's a difference between the human spirit and the mind. And like, as a kid, I was super happy and energetic. And, and I never remember thinking, I never remember being really scared. You know, I, I remember there being painful and like scary moments in terms of like shots and things that I had to do. But, but I feel like as that I had this strong spirit and, and, and will, and, um, and I actually got through my, um, my rounds of chemotherapy and, and treatments a lot faster than they, than they had expected. And, um, and I believe it had to do with like that spirit. And I mentioned that because, mm. you know, especially in this conversation, um, it's like, we often think more about wellness and, um, and maybe, you know, medicine or for ability to heal. And, you know, we think it has to be a physical process, but I believe so strongly that, you know, our, our spirit is so strong and our will has the power to do things that no medicine or, you know, physical remedy, um, physical kind of wellness remedy has the power, um, has the power to do. And, you know, I don't know if that's, that that's why I was cured or why, why it happened fast, you know, why it happened faster. But I really, I do believe in the power and the, the, the possibility, um, possibility of that, of that for sure. So I do draw on that experience, you know, even to this day to kind of remind myself of those, um, of those things. And it does, you know, continue to influence my life in various ways. Absolutely. And, and mindset's everything. And, you know, that, that spirit 
we it gets drummed out of us out of most mm-hmm. of us uh, as we you know you see a kid and like you're saying they're free they're there's no fears anything's possible yeah. you've your mind you're so creative your mind's so open and and the world just drums that out of us and it teaches yes. us you know do this don't do that puts us in categories and you almost have to spend a lifetime undoing it if you yeah, want to totally oh yeah that for path. sure like yeah do you see that as being um a big issue oh yeah totally i mean you know and and i have two little kids now so like i you know i can see the stark contrast right like as you see you know he's my i have a one and a half and a four and a half year old so you could see you know see kind of even when i'm telling them no i'm like oh man you know i'm, I'm already shaping and molding them in that way but yeah i mean to your point like as adults it's it's um it's so it's so hard to maintain that purity or that connection to to like our real self, like our real, like, and when I say self, like spirit or so like, you know, that deeper part of it that as a kid, it is like, it's that pure, that more pure form. And I think to your point, it's like, as we go through, we get, get, get older and enter more and more, you know, as we (laughs) phases of adulthood that we stay as connected to that pure essence in terms of like, you know, what, you know, what really like, what really, what really drives us and lights us up. And like, um, and I think that's one of the, yeah, that's really one of the keys to, um, to, that's really one of the keys to well being and, and, and a, um, and just a more meaningful, meaningful life. And how do you think we change that in society? I mean, you talk about you invested a lot in your own mental well being at a young age. You were curious, mm-hmm. you sort of had that, yeah, that natural predisposition to looking into it. A lot of people don't. I think, I've went down that path from questioning things from events that happened in my own life and feel, you know, probably have a more of an inquisitive mind and feel fortunate for that. But a lot of people just either circumstantially or just naturally won't, you know, will be pulled to wherever the world takes them. Um, are there, do you, yeah, how do, how do you see that we could make some changes in that area? On, a, on Well, a I think scale? what you said is it's like, that's, we have to interrupt that cycle, you know, we have to interrupt that, you know, I call it the automaticness of life, like we're all in this, you know, and that automaticness, like that pull that rat race that that, you know, all the stuff, all the distractions, all of the emails, all that stuff that just kind of is dictating our lives on most days, as opposed to us kind of consciously creating our lives and our days, we've got to, we've got to like interrupt those patterns as much as possible. And um, yeah, as you mentioned, like when I was 19, I mean, starting from when I was 19, I invested in like thousands, tens of thousands of dollars into my, my mental health over the course of like a decade. And I mean, it was because, Mm. you know, I had a, I had a sales job as a, in college that I was actually really, I was, I loved, and I was really, really good at it. Cause it, to me, it was really fun. It was all about like relationship building and kind of running my own business. And I, and I loved it, but it actually got me into some kind of like motivational type, you know, courses and stuff. Um, um, but one that I did, which I don't know if I, I don't, I don't know if we talked about this last time, but it's called landmark education, which is all over the world. And, um, and you know, it's kind of like a life education type course, but it, but well, what it did was like at 19, it, you know, the first, the first course was like this three day event. And then I did, I did multiple things like that. And I've done retreats with Deepak, but what that first one did was it had me really take responsibility for my life, get out of any type of victim, you know, mindset and really, you know, really look at myself as being the source of my life that, mm-hmm. that it was really up to me to make the changes that I wanted to make. And that if there was anything going on that was rough in my relationships or like with my parents, I still had, you know, this rebellious kind of, you know, thing with, with my parents. And I realized I had to take responsibility for the way I was acting to them. And, you know, and it, it helped shift my relationship with my parents. And so really like at an early age, that investment um, in shifting the way my mind was working 
made a massive impact on the direction of my life. And it, and it made me think from an early age, I started answering deeper questions about what do I want my life to be about? Like what are, you know, what is my like mission and purpose? And I, and I, but, but without, without creating the time and space, you know, for things like that, like, you know, I was in like, a course for like three days where there's no distractions and you're really just thinking about your life and what you want. And that level of intentionality was, you know, set the tone for the rest of my life. And I, and I did many things after that to keep reinforcing it. But I guess like, you know, my point is that we live like we live in this world where there's not much time for conscious thought. Like no. The second we have a break, right? Like the second we have a little bit of a break, we grab our phone and then like, you know, we're scrolling through social media, we're answering a text or an email. And all of a sudden that little bit of space to maybe like contemplate something or to like daydream or strategize, like get zapped. So like nowadays we have less and less and less time for that conscious thought. And so I, I really think that, you know, in terms of one of the first thing that we all should do to improve our mental health is, is take time for, for, you know, real events like that, you know, doing the, you know, doing the course or the retreat that creates it, that that's, that helps lay the groundwork for what we really want in life and helps us reframe all of the stuff that is always going on in our, in our, in our minds, you know, because it won't, it won't happen with a quick interaction. It might not even happen with a, you know, a bunch of therapy sessions. It takes like some, a real break from all that automaticness to like consciously think about who we are and, and, you know, what we want in life. So is that too long so, of an answer? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I love that. You, my mind was jumping to so many places as you're saying that, because there's just so much in that answer and it's so important. And, you know, like you're saying, we're taught in the world, it's about just the next thing, productivity. And even when it comes to mental health and our personal development, it's like, okay, how do I, how do I hack learning this? How can I quickly right. acquire all this information and hopefully get yeah. there? And, uh, and it's not going to work. You've got to actually yeah. experience it and you've got to go through it. And um, one of the things you were talking about there, I was actually talking to a psychologist the other day, um, and he was talking to me about that with, with parents, you know, one of the points of, um, we can often hold all this resentment to our parents and, you know, for our whole lives, sometimes be mm -hmm. so much frustration that they're not seeing eye to eye to us, or they might be not giving us the love and support we feel like we want from them. And they're never, you know, congratulating us on the decisions or telling us to go down a different path mm -hmm. when from their perspective, they're actually doing it because they love us so much and they, uh -huh. They, they don't understand our perspective and they're doing it to protect. And if you could, you know, like you were saying, you, you had that understanding from the work you did at 19, you saved yourself all these years of having that resentment. And that's just, in yeah, well, or then, not, yeah. not exactly. No, Cause I see, I still have, <laughs> but no, it's, it's true in the sense that the awareness is what made a big difference because I can, now I notice the second things that, you know, still come up with my, with, with my mom and stuff. And I realize where I'm not taking responsibility, like the things always kind of come up, but yes, like doing it at that early age. I mean, I feel like I could have been in a way, in a way different place. And, and I think, you know, um, people always say like, you know, you're, it's not so much what you say, it's what you do and what are your actions. But I think it actually goes beyond that to, you, you can't just look at people's actions. You also, you have to look at their intentions, you know, cause to your point, it's like so much lies in the awareness of seeing like, well, really what is, what is our, you know, intentions of other people. And sometimes there, you know, when you can really see there's a lot of good intention out there that isn't said properly and, and maybe, you know, it doesn't look like it all the time, but we can treat people according to their, you know, their intentions and believe that they're inherently good. You know, that can, that can change a lot of the way that we experience, you know, experience life and, and our interactions with people. Oh, I think it's critical because no, everyone, we're all going to have different opinions about things, but yeah, underneath that, if, you know, our values, our intentions, if, you know, we're aligned in those other ways, then that can allow you to not get attached to the, emotion or the the your, your yeah. ego being you know hurt from 
whatever you're receiving from that person. But yeah, it totally. is. Cra- I just think it's it, it's a crazy world we live in that you know these things that you've gone and sought out for yourself and had to learn by having no guidance and finding and going on that journey yourself that we're not taught this in general. We're actually taught I the know, opposite. That not, drives me crazy. It. Yeah. It's crazy. It drives me crazy that all these things aren't just embedded into education, but that's a whole other, it's a whole other rabbit hole. We can go, go down another day. <laughs> that's probably a separate, um, yeah. separate interview to go through that. Um, well, yeah, one of the things we were talking about before this that that you, you know, really dive deep into is, you know, looking into purpose and, mm-hmm. and meaning and, and it's something that I'm, you know, such a big advocate for and it's really been the only thing that's really saved me in my life, finding mm-hmm. a purpose and having yeah. that and the only thing that keeps me personally going and I know when I was in my early 20s and had lost purpose, that was when I really just went off the rails and had not, no guidance uh, I think it's such an important thing. And again, I don't know how you find that if you're not willing to explore and do that work. So yeah. um, anyway, are you able to talk a little bit more? Oh, yeah. About, I mean, purpose and, yeah. Ugh, I believe in it so, 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 so much because, um, you know, our, our work, like I, I, I believe that if, if you can tie your, you know, everybody has a pur- purpose can come from different places, you know, um, uh, you know, you can find a sense of purpose and giving back to your community or in hobbies or passions and stuff. But the most powerful place for purpose is in is in your work. Right. And and this includes like full time moms or some, you know, there's full time moms that are really full time moms because that really is their That also really is their, you know, their purpose. Um, and I say that because I have a sister who's, you know, who's a full full time mom and Um, so I don't want to exclude, you know, exclude that group. The, when it's inside your work, it's, it's, it's has an enormous effect because, you know, our, our work has been proven by research as being the single biggest driver of our quality of life, because it takes up the majority Mm. of our time. It's connected to our identity. It's often what makes up a lot of our conversations with people, right? So if you don't feel proud or motivated by the work that you do, it can really be a damper in your, you know, in your conversation with people, or if you want to avoid talking about work versus being lit up by it and sharing that with your friends and family, it, it drastically impacts your life. Right. So, so connecting purpose with work, I think is one of the single biggest, you know, things that we can do to improve our mental health. Because, you know, when we talk about, mental health and people, you know, when people are struggling, struggling in life, we have to think about where, what the source of that is. And, um, there's a good portion of us that, that, that the major source is that work is not having something where we get to sink our teeth into it every day, where we feel like we get to use our kind of natural talents and strengths, or we feel motivated by, the mission and purpose of that work that we do. I mean, I can honestly say that, you know, I just said this to you before, like, like, like I can honestly say that there hasn't been one day where I haven't been excited about what I'm working on. I I think partial, partially because of that work I did at a young age, I feel like every single, you know, kind of job and my business, I have always been kind of pulled by my purpose. And I say pull and not push because it's hard when you have, you feel like you have to motivate yourself, right? That, that makes, that's, that's challenging. But like, I woke up this morning and like, I could notice my thoughts were like, not as, I feel like my thoughts are fairly empowering on a regular basis. I, I do feel like I have pretty good mental health, but like I woke up and I, and I, um, I can like, I notice like more negative thoughts, you know, in my mind. (laughs) And yet, as soon as I just kind of like, I get to my desk or I do some reading around my work or whatever, like it pulls me right away out of that, you know, out of that, that slump. Like it's, it literally feels like this force and this never ending source of motivation. And so I say that cause I know, you know, maybe some people feel, you know, feel, feel stuck. And that in one way can make people like, oh, well, there's not much I can do, but there is, you know, that, that if you, 
have the opportunity to do some work about around what really lights you up and really start to figure that out, it is so important that you find that job or that work that you really love. And I, I do have a program around this. It's called the Legacy Builder Program. And I'm not trying to just, you know, shamelessly plug it, but we, you know, we help people kind of go through transition and figuring out what they love because I believe in it so strong, so, so strongly. But really just my point is to say that it's worth it to put the attention to to figuring, you know, really figuring that out, whether it's on your own or with the help of somebody, because it, 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 um, it has a massive impact on, on our mental health for sure. Absolutely. No, thank you for sharing that. And at the end, I'll, um, we'll get some links that we'll give to the listeners and that'll be in the, in the show notes. So anyone listening, make sure to, to check those out and go to the links when we put them there. Um, but it is, it's so important. And, and I think like we we're talking about before we started as well, like you were saying just then, you know, you, you wake up, sometimes you might not be feeling, you know, as energetic or quite yourself, but then once you, you start working or, you know, you start doing things, you snap out of it and because you've got that purpose. And I think what I found was about maybe 10 years ago now, I'd sort of had this realization that I know what gives me meaning and purpose and that's just to try and make change in this area of mental health and I there's a million different ways I want to do that and I don't know how it'll unfold but if I can just stay focused on that one thing that Mm -hmm. okay the you know everything might feel chaotic today but hang on what's the purpose here I just want to Mm -hmm. make change in this area what can I do today am I doing even one thing maybe that's going to contribute to that and it's such a relief because we're taught to think sort of the opposite where it's about productivity results right. how much money yeah. am i making how much status am i acquiring am i beating that person social media this that the other mm-hmm. things we can't control that are not really attached to anything that meaningful so when you yes. go the other way it's just a huge wave of relief well and i think what you're what you're actually speaking to when you say that is that you're actually tying the motivation more to a um to your your real self motivation and it's something that's coming from you and you're making a decision to be motivated by what matters to you versus what matters to the way you know that what what society expects of you or from more of those externally driven factors right like when you make a choice like you just described where you're like well if i do this one thing that's more aligned with my purpose as opposed to thinking that i should be out there on social media impressing people put you know doing all of the shoulds in life you know of like what we think we should be doing that's that's like every decision we make that's more aligned with you know really who we are and what's true to ourselves versus is kind of like it's like one mini step in this um you know, in this more like conscious, you know, conscious direction. And to your point, you can, you have to almost like acknowledge yourself in the moment of that, you know, to like, be like, I, to, to, to recognize that you resisted a temptation and did something more in alignment with yourself. There's, um, you might be familiar with, um, Bronnie, it's a Bronnie Ware, the, the woman who wrote, um, the five regrets of the dying. Have you ever heard of that book? I, uh, yeah, I actually wrote about it in my book. So I know. Oh, I'm really? Very aware oh, that's so yeah, funny. Yeah. yeah. yeah so yeah, as you, crazy. well, you probably know the right, uh, I don't, let me know if I'm, if I'm getting this wrong, but, it, but I think one of them is, did I live a life true to myself? Is that the right, did I say it right? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're yeah. like, yeah, kind from, of. From my, from memory anyway. <laughs> okay. You know, I, I... <laughs> well, cause that's like one of, one of the, one of the regrets. It's like, it's definitely something to that effect. Yeah. I think that might be it though, but that, you know, like to feel like you, you're at the end of life and you were like living according to other people's expectations and not was true to you. And, and that like contributes to that, to, you know, how, how, how healthy and strong we feel in our mind, because as soon as we do things that are out of alignment with who we really are, that are out of alignment with our own kind of integrity as a person, it starts to like erode you know, it starts to erode the way that we feel about ourselves. And only we know, you know, what that kind of that truth really is. Um, So, you know, like I, I do often think about that regret, because I don't want to end up in that, you know, in that in that place feeling like I was living someone else's life or just living in according to what was 
what was expected and not, you know, not was like true, true to me. But that I think can be at the source a lot of, um, you know, some of the anguish and pain that, that we kind of deal with, deal with mentally can kind of get traced back to that, you know, in, in, um, in many, many situations. Oh, it's such a powerful thing. And, and, you know, if you just strip it back to that and think, okay, if I was on my deathbed, what, what are the things I'm actually going to regret? It's going to be very Mm -hmm. few things and it can just distill it and you can clear out all the crap that we're thinking about on a daily basis that might distract us or be for the wrong reasons. And yeah, it's so empowering to think like that. It just makes it more simple, you know, it's life's short. We've got to Mm -hmm. do what, make sure that we're making the decisions that are in alignment with what we actually want. Yep, exactly. Thank you so much for supporting Move Your Mind. We're expanding the offerings of the organization and we're tailoring everything we do to suit you guys and to try and answer to all of your needs and the questions that you send in. The book is available globally. You can find all of the links at nickbrax.com slash book. And we've just released the Move Your Mind community. We've currently got a men's community group, a women's community group, a general group. We're going to be loading up other groups. And you can find all of the links at moveyourmind.me. This group's been created based on the needs of what we've heard and learnt throughout running Move Your Mind. And we have live events. We've got courses. We've got huge amounts of value, the ability to share information, share ideas, work in groups together to to grow and share your learnings, to learn about different topics. You get email reminders. There's a whole lot of features in there. We're constantly updating it and we're so excited to share it with you. You can find all of the information about it at moveyourmind.me. Another thing that you talk about is uh, the difference between the soul and the mind. Are you able to give a, a a bit of a oh yeah explanation on that yeah sure um so you know i think that that you know it and it ties back to what we were what we were saying a little while ago um there's a lot of you know first it's hard to understand the difference sometimes between you know our mind and our soul like how do we how do we actually you know feel that difference understand understand that difference um the way that's why you know like i mentioned i've done a lot of work with deepak chopra and um and he would often say that the the soul is really the choice maker you know that at the end of the day you can have all the things going on in your mind and then you're choosing from all that that stuff but then who is the you that's making that choice, right? Like, so if I'm, yeah. if I'm at the refrigerator, I'm like, well, I could have this, you know, I could have this salad or I could have, you know, that great leftover like pizza from last night. Those options exist, you know, in my thoughts and in my mind, but the choice comes from a deeper place. There's something that actually overrides the thinking, right? Yeah. So. But the problem is on a day-to-day basis, the soul, it's a lot harder to surface the, the Mm -hmm. soul, like the, the soul is who is the one who can actually be aware of the thoughts. Right. So like when I mentioned earlier that I noticed that I was having these kind of like more negative thoughts than I normally, like when I say I noticed, like who is the I, right. You know, this is another thing kind of Deepak used to say, it's like, who is the I that we speak of? Because somehow there was an awareness of those thoughts. So there's this like kind of disconnect between the thoughts and the I that's having the thoughts, right? So why is that important? The reason why it's important is because the I is way more wise, the soul, like the soul where that's coming from is the one that knows kind of the real you know, right and wrong, not like, not like, right, like what's good or bad, but more like what's right, what's true for you, you know, what's, because it's like the mind is what gets us into trouble in the sense that it's what gets us out of alignment with what's true for ourselves, like what we were saying before, right? Like it's the, the mind is what's comparing to others, has fear of missing out all the time, is trying to be overly strategic or analytical. And I think 
part of the challenge, you know, is that we get stressed out because we're trying to figure out how to control, you know, our mind and control our thoughts or, you know, how do I not have thoughts like that anymore? And, to, and the answer really is to just stop trying to fix your mind and actually just get more in tune with your soul, right? Because mm -hmm. Those, the answers that are already there, it's more about quieting the mind, not fixing the mind, not trying to change and do all that, but then making time to listen to that. So, you know, I mean, the only way to really do that and to get, find that sense of connection is through quiet time, disconnection from, you know, from technologies, find, finding time to meditate, doing activities where you're not, you know, whether that's like, whether that's reading, you know, spending time in nature and, um, there's something called soft fascination, which I love, which is, is some, it, have you ever heard of that? Have you heard of that term before? I haven't soft heard of that. Fascination. No, yeah. It's great. It's like, it's basically, it's what happens to us when we stare at a fire, like a flickering fire mm. or, um, or waves that, you know, when something is the same, but changing like a fire, it's stable waves or they're stable, but there's a, they're changing to a degree, which keeps us fascinated. But what that does is it enables us to kind of gaze and to, and to, to, um, you know, kind of be focused enough, but like relaxed to have, you know, more like conscious, conscious thoughts. Um, but so there are these things that, yeah. you know, enable us to kind of hear the soul and make the soul a little bit louder so that we're not, you know, so focused on the mind because most of what we do on a daily basis daily basis is driven by, by the mind and not the soul. But the key is like, if we can get more in touch with our soul, we can get answers to the bigger questions in life around what is, you know, what is my pur purpose? What is the impact that I want to have? What kind of mother do I want to be? What do I, what I want? What do I really want my life to look like? You know, those are though the answers, the real answers to those questions have to, you know, come come from the soul and 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 so it's it's worth it to kind of get more you know in tune in tune with that i love i love that answer and it's it's so and it's available to all of us and the answers are always there you know it's crazy that our mind is sending us on tangents killing us making us do all these different things when mm -hmm. if we can look below that we might we often find actually the answer is already mm -hmm readily available i don't mm -hmm. have to do these million other things i don't have to uh -huh. prove myself i don't have to you know do all these things i don't want to do and live through suffering so i can actually tap into this thing right now and it's i guess it's what people call listening to your gut and um it's like we always sort of know you know you when you're making a decision you can feel that little thing that um it feels a bit wrong or if there's you know if it's sort of um giving you that anxiety or whatever it is if mm -hmm. you can just pause your gut normally instantly without even thinking just tells you what what the answer is yeah the only thing i would say about the gut i was actually thinking about this the other day because um the only thing with the gut that i feel like is a slippery slope when people say it is that sometimes there's there's this because i think because it's so because it's so important to like really feel like you're really coming, you know, hearing the, hearing the soul. What I think, you know, you have to be careful about is that there are moments where you might think it's kind of your gut or intuition, but it's really like a fear of something. It's like, kind of like when you're going outside mm -hmm. of your comfort zone, sometimes we're going out of our comfort zone and it's, and it's like, it's a good, it's a, it's a good thing, but there's a place inside of us that's kind of like, kind of, you know, kind of scared. And you might think that that's just like, that's like your gut, but are your, you know, and that, and you say, oh, I should just listen to my gut, but really, but really it might be something that is like good for you. And the only real answer to that kind of comes from the soul. So the, so, so I just, I oh, say no, that yeah, because yeah. sometimes I think that, that, you know, sometimes we use like, we can use our gut as an excuse not to, not to sometimes do mm -hmm. things that might be like really good. So anyway, I just, just say that, but but yeah, I mean, you know, your whole, your whole point about it is like, is exactly, you know, is exactly, is exactly on. I mean, you know, you, you get it. But that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Cause it could be mistaken. So it's um yeah, it's interesting to, when you dive into that. Um, 
So we don't have too much time left here. I was, final question before we go into these closing questions. Um, just talking about the workplace and what are what are some of the implications you're seeing in the workplace and you know yeah what what have you seen in that area yeah well i mean the you know like i kind of going back to the what i was saying about just work being such an important you know piece of the equation this is why i i am so motivated to work with workplaces and the leaders you know in workplace that them understand that that you know the the individuals in underneath the roof, you know, of the, of the workplace, um, are, you know, their lives are being so impacted, you know, by, by that workplace. So workplaces need to be thinking about the well being of their people and the mental health of their people. And I don't think, you know, like from what I see in the, in the space, mental health kind of had, you know, people, organizations think like, mental health means to improve the mental health of our employees, we need to be like giving them EAP programs, which, you know, most people don't even take advantage of, you know, or they're, yeah. they're trying to come up with more and more kind of solutions or perks to give people to their, for their mental health. But the problem with that is that one of the biggest ways to improve people's mental health within the workplace is to figure out who is disengaged, like actively disengaged in their work. Who are the people who are really not in the right roles, who have no, are not getting any sense of purpose from their work, who are, who are um, not using their natural strengths on a daily basis, or maybe who have a really crappy manager, you know, who's like eroding, like who's, who's like a bottleneck to their success, right? Like if you figuring out Who's di like there is research that proves that people who are disengaged, actively disengaged in their work, meaning that they are they are unhappy and they're they're being like vocal about that unhappiness, that that group of people is on the road to mental ill health. There is a direct mm -hmm. connection mm -hmm. to like anxiety, depression and people who are actively disengaged at work. So so, you know, the wor workplaces need to not just think, oh, they need to help employees as if it's the employee's problem, you know, like, oh, if our, if our employees are struggling, let's give them this, you know, extra perk. No, the, 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 the key is to first take responsibility for where is the work and the nature of the work responsible for the erosion of those, the mental, you know, mental ill health that's currently in that, in that workplace. And so that's the, that's really the responsibility you know, of workplaces in terms of their, their role in this whole conversation around uh, mental health. That's such a good point. Yeah. And it's, um, it's a huge thing. I mean, it's not something that's, it's like changing a culture, I guess. It's something that is going to take a lot of time and a lot of yeah. concerted effort to change, but it, and that's it part of the problem is that it isn't, it isn't a quick fix, you know, and, and they want yeah. to have a quick fix, you know, and, but it does, it's, it's, but it's, it's worth it because you move people out of that category and it catalyzes your, you know, it catalyzes your, your business, but you're exactly right. Like that's, you know, that's part of, that's part of the issue is that it's not, and you have to be committed. You're really committed to, to people to want to do it the the way that's going to have make the biggest difference but it won't be the quickest way absolutely well i'd love to talk more but we're going to jump into these closing questions because i'm sure. going to take up too much of your time otherwise um so first one here is what's your best childhood memory that comes to mind um the first thing that comes to mind is always we being on uh being on our boat growing up i i loved uh loved boating growing up and i and i can I always have this memory of like sitting in the, on the front of front of our boat early in the morning, you know, before my family was awake, my dad driving and just kind of sitting on the, on the front with the sun rising. And those are always my, my favorite memories. Love that. What do you think is currently the biggest burden on mental health in society? Um, the pace of society and the addiction to progress for progress's sake. Yeah, great answer. <laughs> the 
what's your what's your personal definition of happiness fulfillment it's uh living a life that's you know true to yourself and that's um meaningful and fulfill fulfilling not 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 just happy because um we also have this addiction to happiness and happiness isn't there's plenty of meaningful things that we do in our life where we're not not happy and it's the ups and downs of life that make life meaningful so um so a happy life to me is a, a meaningful and fulfilling fulfilling one and a purpose a purpose driven life i love that what are you most afraid of uh not achieving my full potential yeah i think i share that with you and <laughs> final one <laughs> What are you most proud of? What am I most proud of? <laughs> I love my kids. I'm very, very proud of my kids. Um, and just proud to be a mom and, and, um, and doing work I love. I mean, I think I'm, I think I'm just, I think I'm just most, most proud of, of living, you know, living on this path up until this point and not, not ever really wavering from it, despite, you know, how it might be easier to kind of go, you know, like, I mean, I've had my own business for the past 10 years that hasn't always been easy to probably be easier to work for somebody else at different times or, but, um, but I've always, you know, I've, I've always been kind of true to my, true to my path and felt like I really can't do anything else. So, I think I'm most, most proud of that. I think that's the best any of us can do. So no, I love that. And I've, I've loved this conversation. And finally, where can we send our listeners? We'll put all of this in the show notes, but where can we send our listeners if they want to learn more about you and your work and programs? Oh, sure. Well, I'm always kind of around on LinkedIn. So, um, so you can find me there. And then, um, my so my work for workplaces is workplace wellbeing advisors.com and then um the purpose program that i mentioned earlier is called um legacy builder program.com so um so that's on um on another site so those are you know that that those are those are the best ways to reach me no problem well they'll, they'll be yeah we'll have the links to those in the show notes and Danielle, thank you so much for making the time. And yeah, I, I think we could have gone for another couple of hours. There's so many things to talk yeah. about here, but lo lo love these conversations. Yeah. love the work you're doing and so glad yeah. that I've been well, able thank to you. connect with you. Well, thanks. Yeah. And thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And this conversation is, is so important. So I love the work you're doing as well. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks to Danielle Poser for joining me today for Move Your Mind. If you'd like to learn more, you can go to nickbrax.com or you can purchase the Move Your Mind book at nickbrax.com book.